Welcome to week 11. Uh, the end is in sight. In more than, way, more than one way. Um, this week we're going to cover aggregate functions. Uh, that's actually a pretty quick topic. So what I'm going to do is, depending on how fast it goes, I'm going to actually tack on part of lecture for week 12. Because uh, it's something you guys need for your assignment. But get, delivering that during week 12 is getting a little tight to uh, assignment delivery time. So if it if this goes well today, you'll get, you know, half of week 12's lectures. That means week 12 will be like the fastest lecture ever uh, for everybody. All right. So aggregate functions. Aggregate functions are functions that let you view um, a single piece of data for multiple rows of data or multiple pieces of data, depending how you want to do it. Uh, most functions operate on a single row record. Um, so by that, I mean, if you do a, like a string function, it's operating on a single column from a single row. An aggregate function operates on multiple rows and returns a single value. Um, how many of you have used the math functions in Excel? Some average count. Sounds familiar for those of you that have worked with Excel. So there's some pretty common ones you'll see. Um, there's count, which counts, if you do a count start, counts the number of rows in the table. Or I should say the number of rows in the result set being returned. Count name, it'll count the values in a specific column where the value is not null. So it'll only count not null values. So it's a good way to check, you know, how many filled in values you have. Sum, well, adds it up. Average gives you the average, min gives you the minimum, and max gives you the maximum. An example of an aggregate function. Select sum order total as order sum from retail order. So in this example, essentially it's adding all the order totals and giving you a single value. So it's unfiltered, ungrouped. It just counts all those values. And that's the exact same one I had up a minute ago. And of course, you can always uh, rename it uh, because depending on which database engine you work with, the aggregate function will either return as a no column name or it'll come back with literally the name of the function as the column name. You can do actually multiple aggregates at once. Works just fine. Um, it's, you know, useful sometimes when you need to know a bunch of different pieces of math at once. And counting, of course, returns an integer, tells you how many rows there are. That's the one where um, when people are counting, they don't always realize that it'll count duplicate values. So you can use the distinct keyword, which you guys learned about last week, which lets you return unique rows. But if you use distinct inside of a count, it will give you only the unique values. So it'll count how many different versions of that column there are instead of how many values in the column. And I am going to drop to PG admin so I can basically demonstrate because it's just so much easier in the slides. All right, I'm still using my flight DB. Here's my count of the airports. Yay, 8107. Uh, that's a number we should recognize from last week because, well, that's the number I was using a lot when I was doing the examples about distinct and stuff. Um, what we can do is we could go uh, count city from airports. Again, 8107 because there are no null cities. But here's the distinct part of it. So I go count distinct city. And now we've got 6,977 because some cities have more than one airport. Ottawa's got two or three. Toronto's got, you know, several. New York has got 
three, you know, different cities. The, the bigger cities will have more than one airport. Um, so distinct basically finds only how many unique versions there are of a given value. So if you're telling it to count the distinct cities, it counts each name of the city only one time. So it tells you how many unique versions of cities you have. Um, I'm going to switch over to sum. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do sum min and max. I'm actually going to do all the other the other common aggregate functions. Uh, so I'm going to do the total of the elevations, the smallest, the biggest, and the average elevation for all the airports. And I'm going to go go. And we know that the sum is this. The minimum is 1,200 feet below sea level. The highest is 14,472 feet above sea level. Uh, that's probably, you know, in the Himalayas, very likely. In Nepal, yeah. Oh, they just, they're, well, they're created in memory. Oh, absolutely not. Um, these are transient values. So these are known as um, scalars. In other words, it creates a function, returns a single value. So this is where, you know, aggregate functions start having a bit of a cost. Although, you know, I'll run it and it'll say it ran in 69 milliseconds. Well, that's really fast because it's I just ran it, so it's already cached. Um, if it were to be run again, say, in a minute where the server's cache has now expired, because the database servers only keep the cache for a very short amount of time. Uh, usually it's based on how much traffic it gets, of course, but... Um, it'll have to rerun it. And ag some aggregate functions can be expensive, some can be cheap. Uh, these are fairly cheap. Um, but, you know, they're there. Um, so, we are going to start making this a little more useful, because, you know, these numbers are fun and all, but they're not that useful. I am going to add the country ID to this. And I'm going to run this, and now I'm going to get an error message. And where's my messages? Uh, column airport country ID must appear in the group by clause, which is where the next slide was going. So often with aggregate functions other than count, you will regularly want to use a group by. Group by creates bins. So, how many of you have actually ran a survey and had to collate the results of said survey? Nobody. One, kind of. Let me tell you, collating the results of a survey sucks ass. Um, it is, an ex especially back in the day before, you know, computers were commonly used, literally, you had people sitting there with the survey forms tabulating the results. And if it was a question that was like, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you hate your life? You'd have to figure out, you know, how many people, you know, 10 hate their life and how many people like their life at 1. And then figure out the averages and the counts of each of the levels and everything. So we would need to group it by certain criteria. Group by basically creates uh, separate little bins, and it summarizes the aggregate functions by that bin. Um, you can see here, now we got our country IDs going down. Some, min, max, and average are now broken down by country. Um, if I were to go... Let me just go run that. Let's go see what 87 is so we can see how intelligent those uh, numbers are. Trinidad. That makes absolute sense why, you know, most of the airports are 40 feet above sea level. Because, you know, Trinidad's in the Caribbean. The islands are, most of the islands in there aren't very tall. 
Um, so this is becoming a little more useful. Um, obviously, if you're doing this with business systems, uh, you'd be playing against money, um, sales orders, that kind of thing. You can also order by. And I could order by the country ID if I wanted, and that's fine. So now I'm sorting by, oops, Daisy. Let's take this one out. So now I'm sorting by country, not that useful. Let's say I wanted to know which country had the highest elevation. Um, there's two ways I could do this. I could go order by max elevation in descending order. And whatever country 212 is, let's go see where 212 is. I was guessing uh, Nepal for this one. China. Okay. Apparently China has the highest airport. The um, So you can sort by the elevation. If you, you can also go... Uh, you can rename the elevation so that the, the functions make a bit more sense. Or I should say the uh, return. And when you do that, you can actually order by that alias. And that will work also. That way, you can make it a little easier to read when you have to go back and look at your code later. Uh, especially if you're ordering by multiple columns. Um, so. So far, you've seen the basic aggregates. You've seen me pulling from an from an table, uh, and I'm grouping by specific column. Uh, you can group by multiple columns. Um, I'm going to switch to airline air, aircraft. Select structure aircrafts. I just got to double check what my columns are. Okay, I'm going to go count by. I'm going to the. Helps if you put in the parentheses name, comma, uh, I'm going to count the wake sizes and let's go see how this turns out. So I got two of those numbers. Um, let me just switch back for a second. And if you guys wondered how your labs get created, literally I do this. I sit there and I write some queries and I write a question based on the query. That's how I know there's actual proper answers for uh i'm going to count every distinct description from the aircrafts 343 i'm going to group by name i'm going to display the name so right now i've got the name is the manufacturer the first count is the kind of aircrafts and the second one is the kind of wake sizes and as you can see right now that the wake size is kind of useless because it's literally counting the same amount as there are descriptions. Uh, if I went distinct wake size, now we're going to see that um, Aerospatial has two, Airbus has two sizes of wakes instead of three, because uh, Airbus doesn't really make small airplanes, so therefore they got medium and large wakes. Um, Antonov, well, they make all kinds of sizes. So we can group by name. And if I wanted to, I could go order by uh, name, comma. Um, code. And if I try to do the code, it's going to give me an error because I didn't include the code as part of the um, column. Actually, if you're going to do an order by, you also have to have it here and here. Let's go run that and see what happens. And now we're down to one, 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 one for everything. Because if I threw in the code up here, uh, you'll see that every aircraft has a unique code. So you got the Airbus 310. Um, 
A, B, three, three. These are just different codes for the planes. So there's a bunch of different things you can do with your aggregates. There's things you can't do with an aggregate. One of which is You're not allowed to use an aggregate in the where clause. And for once, Postgres gives a really good error message, as you can read. Aggregate functions are not allowed in where. The reason for that is operates for. So what happens is you do the it does select something from the table, so it goes to the table, then it goes where, so it filters out what rows you want to look at, and then it does the aggregate function. So it operates the aggregate functions on top after the where has been done. So the math operates on fewer columns. So you can't do an aggregate in the where clause because the aggregate part of the SQL process hasn't happened yet. So you can't filter on something that hasn't happened. It's like saying true is equal to false. It's impossible. The other thing you can't do, and there's actually one more nifty trick I gotta show you guys. The other thing you cannot do is run an aggregate on an aggregate. But I wanna know the average count. Sounds like a, a actually a decent question to ask, you know. On average, how many planes does each manufacturer make? And if you run this, you get another error message. Uh, aggregate functions cannot be nested. The reason for that is once it's done the aggregate functions once, it can't do it again because it's done. There is no, hey, I've got an aggregate function, now I'm going to do another aggregate function because I just happen to have a second one. You can't do that. There's not a single database server to let you do that. There is a way around it, and I will show you guys that next week because it has to do with joins and subqueries, which is next week's topic. But you cannot uh, nest aggregate functions. It's just a no-no. All right, so I'm going to take this out and run it, make sure my query is still working. Okay, so earlier, you know how I said you can't say where and use an aggregate function? We do have a clause called having. So if you remember uh, two weeks ago when I was talking about, you know, the six pieces, having is just before order by and right after group. Having allows you to filter on the results of the aggregate. So let's back up for a second. Repetition is good. It's going to pull from aircrafts. And if I happen to have a where clause, it'll reduce the amount of rows being operated on. Then it will run the aggregate. And now we can run having on the results of the aggregate. So having filters based on the aggregate. So I could go um, greater than five. So I just want manufacturers that have at least five planes. And I got to take off the code because so I know that's not going to work. Let's try that again. All right. So now we got manufacturers that have at least five planes. So some people will abuse the having, and they'll actually go and uh, weak size is equal to large, and run it. Ah, of course I did. Wow. Good job, Dan. And weak size must include being the group by. So this is something I used to do with MySQL, and MySQL let me do it because MySQL is like special that way. Um, and it helps if I actually type everything in the way it's supposed to be typed in. So now we've got this. So you'll notice that 
wake sizes in an aggregate, I'm actually using it as a where clause. And it has to be in the group by. Honestly, this is very inefficient because not only is it doing all the math, it then has to go back through the results and actually start doing some, is this true, is this true kind of stuff. Really, you should be doing like this. And it'll give you the exact same result. Um, but it will be less expensive, if that makes sense. Um, because what's happening is it's only going to do the math on the rows. So if I were to go um, select the count of star from aircrafts where wake size is equal to large. I run that. 48 rows. So it's only operating on 48 rows instead of operating on 300, 3,000, 3 million. Um, it's just going to run. You're going to use less memory. Um, database servers are very memory sensitive. Uh, it's really easy to run out of memory fast because you're not writing things well. It's like writing an infinite loop where the code just never ends. Um, so, some of you might have wondered what button I just pressed, because now I have a graph on the screen. Um, it's this button. It's called Explain. So, what Explain does is it shows you the steps that are being taken when running a query. And you will see right here that it'll do, this is showing table scan. Because I don't have any indexes, which is a top. Um, but there's a sort here. I mean, there's a table scan here. It sorts the result. So this one query is showing you something from the last two lectures, literally. So the last two lectures summarize a single query. You've got, oh, hang on, almost, I'm lying. Just like that, there we go. Now it's got what? I'm pulling multiple columns. I'm giving an alias, I'm doing an aggregate, I'm pulling from a table, I'm putting a where clause, I'm grouping, having and you know, I'm sorting it. This one as an example. So I don't lose it. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to the slides really quick to make sure I didn't miss anything, but I'm pretty sure I just covered, yeah, here's the from, where, having, and this, okay. So when the where clause specifies which rows are going to be used to determine the groups, having specifies which groups will be used. Um, in general, you always place the where before the group by. Uh, some database products don't have that placement requirement, um, but I couldn't tell you which ones because everyone I've worked with requires things to be in a certain order, which is select from where group by um, and then having an order by at the end. Um, so always put it in that order when you're building your queries. Like literally this order here is the order you'd put it in. Uh, it'll give you a properly crafted uh, query. Um, there's ambiguity in statements that include having both the where and the having. So because the results could vary, um, at the SQL server will always do the where before the having, even if it lets you do it in a different order. It's a bit like in math where you always resolve the parentheses before you resolve the rest of the equation. The SQL interpreter has a hard set rule 
that it'll always do the wear before it does anything else. So that reduces the amount being pulled back. Um, you can group by multiple columns, which I showed you guys that too. Um, I gave you guys, I showed you guys what the error was when you were trying to pull back a column that's not included in a group by. Uh, I mean, as in other words, you got a display column. So in here, if I were to take out uh, the group by, oh, come on, the group by, it'll give me an error saying, you know, it must appear in the group by uh, because you can't have a display column unless it's in the group by in every database server except for MySQL. MySQL will allow you to have display columns without a group by. It takes the query and goes YOLO. It literally grabs the first value in every column you're trying to display and says, there you go, bro, here's your numbers. Instead of telling you you're not allowed to do that, it just manufactures values. Um, well, it's not manufacturing the values, it just doesn't do a group by, but since you told it to give it a column that has to display something, it grabs the first one it sees. So, in MySQL, this would come out with the very first aircraft manufacturer. Um, it's a good thing for you guys that you're learning on Postgres this semester because it's not going to let you make that mistake. Um, it's good to get into the habit of not making that mistake because I've seen a lot of stupid mistakes made against MySQL because it's loosey-goosey behavior for some of this stuff. Um, Order by, I already did that too. Um, yeah, so I already, they're just saying the same thing a second time. Um, and this is saying how you can't use it in a where clause because it hasn't been run yet. Um, And if I were to, so let's say I had an aggregate in here and I, I decided to rename this. Uh, I wonder if it's going to do what I think it's going to do. It should give me nothing. Column aircraft size, aircraft count does not exist. So this slide is specific to uh, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server. In theory, you could actually create an aggregate column and it won't bark. It just won't give you anything back. Postgres is smart enough to not do it and tell you that, you know, you're being stupid, essentially. And I think that's almost the end. Um, oh, I don't know why this is in here. Okay. Um, this isn't an aggregate function. It's concatenation. You guys know what concatenation is, right? Take string one, add it to string two, you get string three. Or at least that's how Java makes it act like a concatenation is. Um, what we can do, and I'm going to go back with my aircrafts. I'm going to go, uh, Postgres does concatenation a little different from other database servers. Uh, MySQL uses a function called concat. Postgres actually has an operator. Um, I hit that and okay. I wish it would stop explaining. Can I tell it to stop explaining? Go back to the query. So let's run that again. It just takes the tab away. Right, well, that came back. Okay, sure. Good enough. So right now that's not useful because it's gluing things together. I could in theory put in a space. And then put in my other concat that now go uh and I could call this planes as planes and go. And now we have a nice list of aircraft manufacturers of the planes they make. Concat as you've experienced in Java. It's just how you do it, it's a little different. 
Um, we have a few, there, there's one more function that's useful, uh, which is trim. My, the, unfortunately, I can't really demonstrate trim very well. Um, well, actually I can, let's go do this. I go, with spaces at both ends. And so, as you notice, we can just do a select without a table, as long as you give it an activity to display. It's uh, me hiding the spaces in my... Uh, <laughs> it's doing the trim for me. So we have functions called trim. Can anybody guess what trim does? Yeah, so trim gets rid of the space at both ends. We have the option for an L trim. We'll trim just from the left. Or we also have an R trim, which just trims from the right. Um, I don't know if you guys covered string functions in Java yet. Um, you know, when you have a string object, it has a bunch of built-in functions, uh, including uh, length, trim, and a few other things. That's the same thing, except these are functions that are, you know, literally. Uh, I think I've got one called length, pretty sure. 52 characters long. So these are nice string operators that I have kind of thing. Um, and I bet you that's the last slide. So yeah, I, I literally covered all the slides in my little five minute demo, um, which is why I'm gonna jump into the week 12 content so you can get some of that content for the assignment because the first half you need for the assignment. So I am just gonna go, uh, not week 12, week 13, I lie. All right, so I'm gonna go from the beginning and the week 13 content, when you look at the um, words, Dan, at this CSI or whatever they want to call it now, the um, course schedule, they talk about this content. I try to cover this topic um, early because it's the last requirement for the assignment. Um, you will, there's still a bit of SQL you guys have to learn to be able to finish the assignment, like for the, for the, uh, part three with all the queries, there's like three or four queries right at the end that you're not gonna have the material for, but this at least will give you, um, the rest of the content because next week might go a little long compared to the aggregates. All right. The views, views, a view is a named query stored inside the database. Um, my database prof, when I went through college would have a kitten if you heard the expression I'm about to use. It's like a bookmark in your web browser. You know when you go to a website, the URL is like super long and then you drop a bookmark and then you never need to remember that super long URL? That's what views are for. Um, every time a view is, is called by its name, it executes the query. Um, in other words, you're taking the query, you store it in the database permanently with a name. Then you can call that query as if it was a table. The view allows you to hide the base table and only show a subset or summary of one or more base tables. <clears throat> Complex queries that need to be executed frequently can be saved as a view for easier use. Um, the syntax, this is MySQL, but it's the same syntax for Postgres. Uh, create or replace view, give it a name as, and then you give your select statement. Uh, the or replace allows you to basically overwrite the existing view. Uh, different database servers will take that differently. Like their behavior with the replace is different. Um, I know for a while, Postgres, if you change the number of columns coming back, you couldn't do an or replace. You actually had to drop the view and recreate it. Uh, MySQL just lets you replace because apparently it doesn't care. Um, the name of the view is the name. And then, you know, the, the rest of the query is there. So an example is create view doctor as select name of hospital comma doctor from the hospital. And that's, you know, how you create the view. Then you go select star from hospital instead of, you know, the longer query. You can alter the view to change the structure. Um, I've had very bad luck with alter view. 
I've tended to stick to create or replace over alter um, because not all database servers will do the alter the same way. So, um, so this alter is just adding an extra column to the view. And if you want to get rid of view, it's drop view. And you can put in if exists. In other words, so it doesn't throw an error if it doesn't find it. Uh, the name of the view. And I'm going to do um, a quick example of creating a view based on what I was just doing. So I'm going to go back to, no, not that one. This one. Okay. So let's pretend this is a fairly complex query. I could go create um, create view. You don't have to prefix it with a V. That's just a me thing. Um, uh, large aircraft. Sure. As. And I hit run. And it's going to say create view, nothing else. And now I could go. Instead of that big long query, I got a nice short little query. What's cool about the view is it looks like a table, it smells like a table, it behaves like a table, but it's not a table. It basically put, runs the entire query, takes the results of that, shoves it in memory into a temporary table called whatever the view's called. And then it behaves like, like a table. Um, this is actually one of two ways you can get around the aggregate on aggregate issue, by the way. Uh, this is, you know, method two of doing it. Because now, remember earlier, I can do the average of the count, and I could go. And there's my average, because I cheated. I created a view, it does the math, and then I can do an aggregate on the math. So the view lets you get around some of those issues. Ignore my phone. Um, so that's a normal view. So when we talk about views, there's two kinds of views. There's dynamic views and materialized views. Each view has an advantage and it has a very specific purpose. A dynamic view is known as a virtual table or a logical view. Some people refer to it as a derived table it's not that's not what it is but some people will call it a derived table because that's what their profs called it when they went through school or the textbook they're reading decided to call it a derived table um but it's really it's a virtual table or a logical view a dynamic view is good because it doesn't take up any extra room the only space it takes up in the entire database is literally the amount of characters required to store the query When invoked, the query is executed by the referring table. So it's as if you ran the big, long, complex query yourself. But you didn't. You just called it by its short name. Um, and obviously, a complex query can be simplified by creating a dynamic view. Um, a dynamic view is live. It's real time. In other words, if the t data below, behind the scenes changes, the dynamic view will see it right away. So if I were to add a new aircraft manufacturer with six airplanes of a large size, suddenly it would just be live updated right away. It always gives you the most recent data. That's why it's called a dynamic view because it's you know kind of dynamic. Stuff happens right away. Um, 
and this I already talked about that. Materialized views, on the other hand, are persistent views. A data set is created from the tables and stored in the database. Materialized views take up room. Each time the materialized view is executed, it uses the stored data, not the live data. And usually people at this point go, well, what's the point? The point is that a materialized view is used for data warehousing or high performance reports. It does the math once and everybody who runs it again afterwards sees the results of the math that's already been done. So imagine you're doing a math test and you know as a group it's a materialized view. So the second the first person answers it, everybody who gets to that question sees his answer because somebody else has done it once. That's a materialized view. Um, it is used extensively in high volume databases for summarizing data. Um, all major database systems, except for MySQL, have materialized views. MySQL does not. MySQL, you have to create a table, insert the records to the table, use the table as your view. It's fun. It's almost the same, but not quite. Because, um, well, here, here's the code to create it, and I'll explain why in a second, because why materialized views are a bit better. So instead of just create view, it's create materialized view. Wow, that's com that's extra complicated, eh? You're gonna add an extra keyword and you're literally creating a whole new structure inside the database. That is taking up disk space. You can drop the view, but, uh, so what happens is when you have a materialized view, um, the data is not live. So you could theoretically, um, add data to the table, but the materialized view wouldn't see it. Because once it's run the first time, the data is stored permanently. Which leads me to, what's the point of the materialized view if it, you know, is a once and done kind of thing? That's because materialized views allow you to refresh the data. So, Often systems that have materialized views will have a job that runs once a day or once a week or once a month, depending on what the needs of the data is, and it refreshes the view. What it does at that point is it essentially re-executes the original query, truncates the underlying table, and puts the data back in, which is the exact same process you have to do with MySQL. You have to truncate the table and then reinsert all the new values, but the thing is, is you have to run three or four commands as opposed with a materialized view. You just go refresh materialized view and you give it the name. And poof, it takes care of running all the queries, takes make sure everything's up to date. Um, it's like magic. It works well. Um, job I just left, we used materialized views a lot. Uh, to summarize sales data over years. So we summarize uh, year over year sales data, uh, the yearly trends, the historical trend as in, you know, how are the sales doing over, you know, a long period of time kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so we use materialized views for that. And if you delete data, the dynamic view sees it, the materialized view will not. You'd have to refresh the materialized view every single time. Um, okay, so one last thing. Updating a view, which is misleading because there's another slide that said something about updating views. In this case, um, it's called, it's, it refers to creating an updatable view. So it means you're gonna create a view that lets you add, modify, or delete data using said view. But it's only possible if all the constraints involved in the view are being honored. In other words, if you're going to create a view you can insert data into, you have to include the primary key in the view. You have to include every not null column in the view. If 
it's in if it's a view that has multiple tables in it, you have to include every piece of every table. Um, which you know I'll be talking about joins next week. But if you have a view with a join in it, you'd have to have the primary keys of both tables. You'd have the foreign key. You'd have all the not null columns for every table. At that point, you've got so much of those tables. You know, what's the point of even using a view? The only advantage I'd ever see to using a view in this situation is if you have certain columns that are sensitive, that not everybody should be able to see. So you write the application to use that view and not the table itself. And only specific parts of the application are allowed to access those areas. Um, common uses for that would be databases that store things like SIN numbers or credit card numbers. You don't want everybody to be able to see somebody else's SIN number. or their credit card numbers. You don't want everybody to be able to see that. So you could have those as other columns that are nullable that are not included in an updatable view. That's pretty much the only time I could see that being needed. Um, so after refreshing, okay. So indexes, am I gonna to touch on indexes today? I don't think you need indexes for the assignment. So I'm going to say no. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second on whether or not that was actually in the assignment. Okay. So these were two quick topics, which is good for you guys, considering probably the workload you guys are on right now. Um, it'll let you go home a little earlier. You really should start on the assignment. Just putting out there, some groups have. Assignment two, group work with, you know, lab members. Don't wait until Saturday night before it's due to start because you're going to suffer and your group members are going to hate each other. <laughs> so make sure you start working on the assignment two. Keep working on the labs. Um, you have everything for lab eight and almost everything for the assignment now. Uh, next week, the first half of the lecture next week, we'll cover pretty much what you need for the rest of the assignment. So you're almost there. Because I don't think I can cover it in an hour, otherwise I would. All right. Any questions? Going once, twice, three? Okay, done. <laughs>